Our Father in heaven, I hold in my hand your word. It is true. It is precious. It is eternal. It is personal. I pray that you will please let me speak from your word with the humility of Moses, with the clarity of Paul, the passion of Peter, but with the authority of Jesus Christ. I pray that as we speak from your word, that you will let your word warn the sinner, mature the saint, and ready us all for the coming of Jesus. May self be dead, may Christ be lifted up, may the cross be central, may your spirit be in control. And oh God, I pray that if any word I speak comes in the way of your message, you will remove it. For I ask this in the precious, worthy name of Jesus Christ, your Son. Amen. Luke is one of us. Luke was a Gentile. In fact, he is the only non-Jew to write a portion of the New Testament. Non-Jews or Gentiles had a tough time being united with the early, mostly Jewish Christian church of the first century. And Luke helped that to change. He wrote the Gospel of Luke for Gentiles, people like you and me. So who was the apostle to the Gentiles? Paul was. So it's natural then that Paul would choose Luke the Gentile to be his travel companion. And it didn't help, or didn't hurt, that Luke was a physician. So we read in the book of Acts, around chapter 20 and 21, how that Paul and Luke, after traveling throughout the Roman Empire for a long time, returned to Jerusalem. And before long, Paul was arrested and locked up in prison for two years, and Luke, his faithful companion, stayed by in Jerusalem. What do you think he did in those two years while Paul was locked up in prison? Did he gather material for the gospel that he would write? Most likely. Luke was good at research and at writing. In fact, the Gospel of Luke is the largest, the longest book in the New Testament. And if you add the book of Acts to the book of Luke, then you have Luke, the greatest contributor to the New Testament. No one wrote more than he did. For the Gentiles. For the Gentiles. Matthew wrote especially for the Jews, so did Mark, so did John. Yes, Gentiles read it too, but particularly Luke's gospel for the Gentiles, people like you and me. In fact, in chapter 1, verse 3, Luke says, I took particular care to do exhaustive research. So do you think that during those two years he then spent time talking to eyewitnesses who saw Jesus, who heard him speak, who may have looked him in the eye? Very possibly. Do you think that possibly during those two years Luke interviewed the mother of Jesus, Mary? Very likely because if you read the whole chapter of Luke 2, the second chapter, It'll be like you are listening to Mary telling Luke the story in her life around the birth of Jesus. See, Luke gives more detail about the birth of Jesus than any of the other writers, just like a mother would tell it. Now, there's something that stands out in the Gospel of Luke. And that is that Luke has this global view. He's always drawing our attention to the entire world, wanting to be sure that we understand that the gospel is meant for everyone, not just one nation. 
Matthew wrote specifically for Jewish people to understand who Jesus is, his genealogy and everything about Jesus. Mark the same, John the same. But here is Luke. He wants us to get the big picture of the gospel, the entire world, that Jesus is the Savior of the world. The Jews looked for a Messiah who would come and deliver them from the Roman world, the Roman Empire, the Roman Emperor. But Luke says more than that. Jesus came to, in fact, seek and to save all who are lost. So we feel included. We feel that it's more about the Jewish nation being delivered. It's also for Greeks. It's also for Romans. It's also for Americans. It's for all Gentiles. We're included in this gospel of Luke. He wants us to see that the gospel is for more than just one nation, more for just a particular class of people, because during that time, whether you were a Roman or whether you were a Greek or whether you were a Jew, there was a lot of exclusion of people. And Luke writes specifically to say the gospel is for all kinds of people. No matter the nationality, no matter the political persuasion, if it's your enemy, the gospel is for your enemy. The gospel is, says, in Luke, as you read it, you'll notice that he is making a very specific point, that the gospel is for all women. Whereas that culture at that time excluded women from not just the vote. They had no say at all. It included not just the important woman like the, the wife of Herod. No, it included the prostitute. It included the widow. The gospel, Luke points out, more than any other, the gospel is for the slave, not just the free woman, the free man. It's for the slave. It is for all those who are despised in society. It's for the poor. It's for the weak. It's even for the prisoner. That was stunning for the people. Now, all the other Gospels talk about the world. John says, for God so loved the world. But no one like Luke emphasizes this global picture. For example, all the Gospels, all four of them, they talk about John the Baptist. And in talking about John the Baptist, they refer to the prophecy from Isaiah chapter 40, verse 3 and on, which says, there is a voice that prepares the way for the Lord. You remember that? Well, they all stop there except Luke goes on and completes the sentence. He doesn't just say that there is a voice preparing the way for the Lord. Only Luke goes on to complete the sentence and says, all flesh will see the salvation. Everyone. No one's excluded. There's a galaxy of personalities that beam all over the 24 chapters of the book of Luke. He has a story. For you, for me. He's talking to the Western mind, the person who thinks Western, not Eastern. The person who's analytical. The person who doesn't have the heritage of Israel like the Jews had, who have a long history, an ancestry of Moses, of all those people. No, not at all. Here is Luke. He says, it's more than that. I'm talking to people whose roots are in the Gentile world, roots in paganism who have no heritage of the Jews. That's you and I, you and me. We are part of that. Our roots are there. And you feel included in the story of Jesus when Luke tells it. So that brings us then to Luke chapter 2, verse 8. Take your Bible if you have it with you. I'd like to look at that again. And here in chapter 2 of the book of Luke, it's obvious very quickly that he gives twice as much attention to the shepherds in the field as he gives to the birth of Jesus. It's kind of a strange emphasis here from Luke. But remember, he is the inclusive one. This story about Jesus, so strange. He gives more attention to the shepherds than he gives to Jesus. Luke makes, a, makes heroes of the shepherds. Instead of the priests, instead of the noblemen, instead of the king, he makes heroes of the shepherds. 
So go to me, with me to verse 9. It says, suddenly an angel of the Lord appeared among them. Who's the them? The shepherds. Lowly shepherds. And the radiance of the Lord's glory surrounded the shepherds. They were terrified. But the angel reassured them and said, don't be afraid. I bring you good news that will bring great joy to who? All people. That's Luke. To all people. Great joy to all people. Friend, do you feel that joy today? That great joy for all people includes you. Do you feel that joy? Look closely, verse 13. Suddenly, the angel was joined by a vast host of others, other angels, the armies of heaven, praising God. Here is one angel who is announcing the good news, and suddenly that one angel becomes a host of angels. Now, the host here is not the person who invites you home to lunch and acts like the host. The host here in the Greek is the word plethos, which we have plethora. If you talk about a plethora of angels, how many angels do you have? It is a huge number, a large number. So thousands of angels fill the sky, the expanse of the sky, right there where the shepherds are, treating them like nobility. Those who are considered unimportant by the world God considers of supreme importance. These angels are there for, these hand, for this handful of poor shepherds. They don't go to the priests. They don't go to the king. They skip the palace. They skip the temple. Simple shepherds. Simple shepherds. It is the way God does things, you know. Because nobody should feel too unimportant for God to lavish his extravagance on. No matter how you feel today, no matter who has made you to feel unimportant, no matter who has robbed you of your dignity, no matter who has rejected you, God's eyes, you are. Important. The angels here are called the armies of heaven. Why the armies? The armies of heaven. Get this. Here we have an army announcing peace. Not declaring war. Not crying insults on the enemy. No threats. Army announces peace. And this army excels in strength, and it exerts its strength by praising God. Do you know that's when you are the strongest? It's when you praise God. That's the source of strength. The army of heaven is exalting God. Why are they praising God? It says there in verse 13, here's what they say. Glory in highest places to God. Peace on earth on humans' good pleasure. Those are the most profound words of praise that angels could express. It demands our attention. It requires that we give it time, that we dwell on it, that we think about it, that we meditate on it, that we absorb it and then respond to it, accepting it into our hearts. There are three lines here. Did you notice that? There is again. Glory in highest places to God and on earth peace, on humans good pleasure, three lines and three nouns. Got to pick out those key words. One is glory, the other one is peace, 
And the other one is good pleasure, which in Greek is one word. In English, we try and struggle we find, to find an adequate English word for that Greek word. Glory, peace, good pleasure. Hang in with me now. What is that glory? That word glory is all over the Bible. You've read it many times, but here's what it means. It means the radiant, shining forth of the attributes, the qualities of God. The radiant, shining out of the qualities of God. And the angels who are here announcing the birth of Jesus in such eloquent terms, they are shining forth attributes of God. The first attribute of God that we find when you look at these words of the angel, the first attribute there is faithfulness. God is faithful to his promise in that he is sending the Messiah. The attribute of God, faithfulness. It is shining forth. It is the glory of God, his faithfulness. Secondly, he is also shining forth his attribute of power because it said, the angel said to Mary in Luke chapter 1, verse 35, she, he said, the power of the highest will be upon you. Power, attribute of God, shining forth in the birth of Jesus Christ. The third attribute that is so powerful here is the attribute of grace, where God is sending his son to this undeserving world. His grace is shining forth. Do you see a little bit better what this word glory really contains? Shining forth, the radiance of God's character, the attributes of God. You get that? Glory. Glory in the highest places to God. What's the highest places? Any guess on that? He talks about the highest places. Glory to God in the highest. What's that? That's heaven. That's the realm of God, the realm of eternity. It really is saying that all heaven is praising God, declaring the glory of God because of the birth of Jesus. Get this, friends. Get this. This praising God for the birth of the Messiah is not a wish. It's not a prayer. It's not a request. It's a declaration. It's a declaration. This is so important because this giving of the Son from God is His doing. It is not because man has asked for it. It is not because mankind has deserved it or that man would any time in the future qualify for it. It is all God's gracious giving, His doing. That's why heaven is glorifying God for what He has done. Glory in the highest places to God and on earth, what? Peace? Obviously, heaven is filled with the glory of God. Why? Because heaven is spilling over and sending peace to the earth. You know what, friend? Peace comes because God turned away his wrath and sent instead mercy to sinners. Peace comes because God turned away his wrath and sent instead mercy to this earth. If you take the time and read Colossians 1.20, you'll see that peace comes from the blood of the cross. Word for word, Colossians 1.20, lift high the cross of Christ. Peace comes, the Bible says, if you read it there in Acts 10 verse 36, peace comes through Jesus Christ. That's the peace he's talking about. So the baby in Bethlehem brings peace on earth. What peace? What peace? There wasn't peace on earth then, and there hasn't been peace on earth since then. What peace? What peace? Peace on earth? That's a mistake. It should say peace in heaven. I can go with that. Especially after God threw the devil and his followers out, there was peace in heaven. Now there's no peace on earth. Why does he say peace on earth? 
Historians have told us that for the last 3,000 years of this world's history, there has not been peace except for only 300 years out of 3,000. In 1945, when the atomic bomb did its debut, somebody said, the world is inflammable and we only wait for some fool to put a match to it. What peace? What peace? Do you have peace of mind? Is there peace in your life? Isaiah 26, 2 says, He will keep them in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on Him. Is that where you are? Perfect peace? What peace? What peace? Is your mind filled with a perhaps with a jumble of unforgiven memories. What peace? Is there unresolved pain in your life? Frustrating disappointments. Right this moment, right now, can you say that your mind is at perfect peace? What peace? What peace? What kind of peace did those angels announce? It's a very special kind of peace. It's not political peace. It's not even circumstantial peace where everything goes well in the life. I'm healthy, wealthy, and wise. I am at peace. No, not that what the angels talked about. It's a special kind of peace. You know what it is? Go to Romans 5 verse 1. Since we have been made right in the eyes of God by faith, we have peace with God. Because of what the Lord Jesus Christ has done for us. That's word for word, Romans 5 verse 1. Peace with God. Is there any other peace that matters? What peace is most significant to you right now in your life? Circumstantial peace where things just go right and go smooth in your life? Or do you yearn, really yearn more for peace with God? What my ears tell me is that there are a lot of people, a lot of Christian people who seem to be, by the volume of speech coming from their mouths, they are more interested in peace in America, political peace, rather than peace with God. What peace do you long for today? What's the peace the angels came to announce? Peace, peace with God. Is that what you long for? Wow. To bring about that peace, friends, was the supreme purpose, the prime errand of Jesus, the Son of God. He came to bring peace with God. Peace with God comes because God has good pleasure towards you and me. That's how peace comes. You know, as the Father one day appeared there at the baptism of Jesus... Later on at a different time, in fact, three different times, the voice broke through from heaven and said, this is my, what, beloved son, in whom I am well pleased. God could say, the Father could say that about Jesus because Jesus deserved God's good pleasure. We don't. But Jesus earned God's good pleasure for us. Therefore, God can say, looking at you, he can say, I have good pleasure in you. That's why he gives peace on earth. It starts in the heart of God, peace on earth. And therefore, Luke's point is this. Luke's point is, Jesus is our peace. Not my spouse, not my kids, not my steady job, 
not my retirement, not my health, not my wealth, not my success, not my political persuasion. That is not my peace. Jesus is our peace. The Romans praised Augustus, the Roman emperor, for bringing about worldwide peace. Their world was too small. Because Jesus came to bring, as the Prince of Peace, He came to bring peace on earth through His blood. Jesus is our peace. Jesus is our peace. A man was lying in hospital dying and very close to death, and he had the minister come over, and the minister asked him the very important question just before he's going to die, and he said to him, have you made your peace with God? And the man's response was, I didn't know we ever had quarreled. You see, that is the problem with our world today because people so easily today are made to believe that if they are good citizens, they are reasonably successful, and they are culturally religious, all is well with God. What quarrel? People today think more about God like this great-grandfather who lives in this faraway nursing home out there called heaven. They don't hear much about God or from God. They send him their love. They pay the rent. After that, who could ever blame them for having a quarrel with great-granddad? All is fine. One problem. The Word of God reveals that God is holy. And when you dwell and have a sense of the holiness of God, you very quickly realize your greatest need is to have peace with God. You take away the holiness of God and you don't have God anymore. You have a man-made God who fits in and squeezes into the mold that we make him to suit us, to make us comfortable. But that's not the holy God. The holy God is a God who cannot stand sin. Consumes sin obliterates sin. So in Ephesians it says, you were separate from Christ, having no hope without God in the world. But now, in Christ Jesus, you who formerly were far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for He Himself is our peace. When you have found peace with God at the cross of Christ, you find it nowhere else. If you found it at the cross of Christ, there's a bonus. And the bonus is that you also now have peace regardless of the storm that is raging around you. Start at the cross. Peace with God. And see how that affects your response to the storm around you. See, God is the answer. He gives it in Philippians 4, 7. He says, His peace will guard your heart and mind as you live in Christ Jesus. That simply tells me that peace stays with you as you stay close to Jesus. Jesus is our peace. Regardless of the storm, the main storm is over. Jesus brought peace to earth. Conquering the devil. There was a time long ago when they had to test the submarine. And to test the submarine, they had to take it way down below the surface. They had to spend several hours deep, deep down in the ocean. And when it came back up and it came back into harbor, the captain was asked the question, so how did you and the, how did the submarine respond to the storm that we had, this massive storm that we had here? The captain said, what storm? I don't know that there was a storm. And what happened was that this submarine had descended way below the surface to a point which the sailors called the cushion of the sea. That's a place so deep down where the waters are undisturbed no matter what is happening on the surface. Down there, in that place, it's calm. It's peaceful. 
It's the cushion of the sea. Is that where you are? Are you resting on the cushion of God's grace? Can you hear the angels singing even now to you? Singing the song over your stormy life, silent night, holy night. All is calm. All is bright. Around your virgin mother and child, so tender and mild, sleep in heavenly peace. Say it with me. Sleep in heavenly peace.